Connection Data Reporting Rule. Office of Public Counsel, I thank you for filing the motion to open this docket. To those who submitted comments in advance of this workshop, thank you for sharing your insight. And to the stakeholders participating in the discussion today, thank you for making time to be part of this important dialogue. The Commission places great importance on workshops such as this one because it highlights how Commission orders and the limits on Commission decision-making authority directly impact Missouri consumers. As the chair of NARUP's Consumers and the Public Interest Committee, last year I oversaw a collaboration with the National Association of State Utility Consumer Advocates, better known as NASUCA. This collaboration resulted in a resolution regarding the best practices in data collection reporting for utility services delinquencies in payment and disconnections of service. This resolution was the culmination of a four-part webinar series during which panelists highlighted nationwide pervasive problems contributing to inconsistent data reporting related to utility disconnections and delinquencies. Some of the problems included discrepancies regarding what data was collected, the frequency of collecting and reporting that data, as well as who had access to the data. I won't go into detail about the resolution because you can access it in the Commission's electronic filing system with the Office of Public Counsel's initial filing. I'm looking forward to hearing the ideas shared in this workshop as they relate to identifying ways we can strengthen Missouri's disconnection data reporting rules. I encourage each of you to really listen to the other stakeholders, listen to identify barriers and challenges to transparency and changing or expanding data collection and reporting. Listen also so that you can collaborate and identify solutions that will work not only for the stakeholders represented here today, but also the consumers not in this virtual meeting room. Last year, when we set out to develop the data collection resolution, we could not have envisioned what lay ahead in 2020. COVID-19, as you all know, has worsened an already dire situation for so many Americans. So let's do what we can in Missouri to gather the information necessary to assess the situation and prepare for the worst case scenarios so that we can have better outcomes. Again, thank you all for participating. Thank you, John, for the opportunity to offer the welcome and I'm looking forward to the report. Have a great meeting, everyone. Thanks again. Thank you, Commissioner Coleman. Before we jump, uh, go any You're further, welcome. we're going to have a very quick roll call, uh, just so that everyone knows who is here. Uh, in order to make this uh, as easy and quick as possible, we're going to go through the utilities, then the non-utility share stakeholders, staff, and finally OPC. So I'm just going to go down the list, starting with electric and starting with Amron. Is uh, anybody on the line from Amron? Yes, good afternoon. This is Jermaine Grubbs. Can you hear me all right? I can hear you, Jermaine. Thank you. Great. So I am joined by Paula Johnson and Sarah Gibney, who are both uh, attorneys representing Amber, Missouri. Would you also like me to identify the non-attorneys that we have on the line? Please do. Okay, we have Connie Taylor, who is the manager of customer advocacy at Amber, Missouri. Mark Schlake. His last name is spelled S-C-H-L-A-K-E. He's the manager of customer credit and revenue protection at Amron, Missouri. Michael Horn, spelled H-O-R-N. He is the, uh, he is a credit and collections analyst with Amron, Missouri. And then Aubrey Krishmar, 
Last name is spelled K-R-C-M-A-R. She's a regulatory liaison. I think that captured everybody, but speak up if I missed you, Amron, Missouri folks. Hello, this is Shantae Fluellen. I'm a customer advocacy associate with Amron, Missouri. Excellent. Uh, let's go to Evergy. Yeah, this is uh, Roger Steiner. Um, I may not get everybody that's on uh, online, so I'll let them uh, say who they are. Uh, I think Jim Fisher's on, Sarah Gott's on, Julia Dragoo's on, Alicia Duarte's on, Allison Erickson, Chad Karsten, Michael Reinhardt. Am I missing anybody? Linda Nunn. Hi, Linda. How could I forget you? How could you forget me? <laughs> okay. I think that's it. Excellent. Uh, Liberty? Hi, this is Diana Carter, counsel for the Liberty Companies in Missouri. And that would be for Empire Electric, Empire Gas, Mid-States Gas, and Liberty Water. And with me virtually, um, we have Charlotte Emery from Regulatory, and then our customer service and billing folks on the line are Angie Simpkin, Heather Edwards, Denise Martin, and Patsy Mulvaney. You got Josh Sexton as well. Yeah, Josh. All right. Uh, moving to natural gas, starting with Spire. Hi, this is Christopher Galliano. I'm vice president of customer experience with Spire. Uh, I am probably going to miss a few folks who've joined. I know Goldie Boxstruck is on. Um, perhaps Brian Patterson. Yep. Is on. Did I miss anyone? Vidge is on the line as well. Vidge Sadanala, yep. business, uh, our manager of business services, is on as well. Excellent. Summit Natural Gas. <laughs> Oh, is somebody else from Spire? Sorry, that's, this is Goldie. I wasn't sure if you guys could hear me or not. I was talking, but not getting a response. I think I got it worked out now. We can hear you now, Goldie. Thank you. All right, some natural gas. Yeah, John, this is Dean Cooper. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Jim Lydon to introduce the various summit folks that are on the line. <laughs> Sure, yeah, this is Jim Lydon. We've got Annette Ferguson, who's our manager of credit and collections, We've got Brooke South Council, and Katie Desjardin, who is an IT project manager. Excellent. And then I believe the next would be Water and Sewer with Missouri American Water Company. Unless I'm forgetting a gas company. Uh, this is Tim Luft, attorney for Missouri American. We also have Brian Legrand, uh, head of rates for Missouri American. We have Tracy Figueroa, and we have Ryan Smith. Um, there may be even more. Um, speak up, anybody else, if I forgot to mention your name. And I think that, that that's it from our team. Was there anybody else from a utility that I failed to mention? John, this is Jermaine Grubbs. I apologize. I had missed Miss McKenna Howard is also attending for Amron, Missouri. Thank you, Miss Grubbs. Anyone Hi, John. This is Stacy Culleton with Central States. I'm representing Confluence Rivers, Elm Hills, Hillcrest, Indian Hills, Osage, and Raccoon Creek. Colton. And I'm director of customer experience. All right. Any other utility folks? 
Okay, let's do the non-utility, non-staff, other stakeholders. I had a list of several people. I believe Sierra Club was uh, one group. Is anyone from Sierra Club? This is Ed Smith from Sierra Club. Uh, Empower Missouri. Let me just throw that out open, actually. Are there any other uh, non-utility stakeholders who'd like to speak up? This is, this is Lisa Kramer from National Housing Trust. I heard Lisa Kramer from DE. Yes, thank you. And somebody else? Annika Brindle with the National Housing Trust. Thank you very much. Tim Opitz with Renew Missouri's on. Hey, John. Thank you, Tim. And uh, Tori Cheatham with Renew Missouri is also on. Any other stakeholders? All right, let's do commission staff. Hi, John, this is Jamie Myers with staff counsel's office. Um, with me, I know I have staff attorneys, Mark Johnson and Travis Pringle. In addition, um, we have staff directors, Natal Dietrich and Mark Oligschlager. And from our um, customer experience department, we have Contessa King, Ben Rankin, Sarah Fontaine, and from the Consumer Services Department, Jay Eastlick. And I know there may be other staff who are calling in, so if you'd like to identify yourselves now, please do. Tammy uh, Hoover from Black. staff. Gary Bangert, staff. All right. Um, as I've already said myself, I'm John Claz from OPC. Uh, Jeff Marth is on if he wants to introduce himself. Thanks, John. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Excellent. And uh, is there anybody else from OPC on? Yes, this is Linda Mantle. Is there anybody else who's on this call who'd like to speak up or I didn't give an opportunity to? All right. Thank you all. That was fairly easy, I would hope. Um, with that, I'm just going to go ahead and turn things over to Dr. Jeff Mark, who's going to give a presentation. Uh, and then we're going to move into discussion based off that. So, Dr. Mark, if you would. Thanks, John. I'm going to try to share a presentation now. There we go. Can can you see it? We can see it. All right. Uh, give me one second to set up here. All right. Good afternoon. My name is Jeff Mark. Uh, appreciate everybody uh, taking the time out of their uh, Wednesday afternoon. Um, as far as I'm aware, this is the first uh, virtual rulemaking workshop uh, we've attempted. Uh, under COVID conditions, so uh, we'll knock on wood. We'll, we'll hopefully this will be, be a seamless process. Um, so the title of my presentation is really the, the title of the workshop: uh, Service Disconnection Reporting Requirements for Electric, Gas, Water, and Sewer. Um, although it's not stated in EFIS, uh, probably not steam heating utilities. My contact information, if anybody has questions afterwards, uh, I think I know just about everybody that um, spoke up earlier, uh, but um, there's my information. I'd like to start off today by just articulating a couple goals. Uh, the first goal is just to remind us why we are here. Uh, and I'll, I'll advance a couple slides that actually speak to the new uh, resolution uh, that Commissioner Coleman articulated, uh, referenced earlier today, uh, and, and go into a little bit of a detail uh, on some of the resolution points just to, to reiterate the importance of, of this topic. 
to remind us what the problem is. Um, and I think that'll become self-evident as we move forward with this uh, PowerPoint. Ideally, to, to elicit dialogue and constructive feedback, uh, we'll, again, this is sort of new terrain as, as far as a virtual uh, rulemaking workshop. Um, for those that have participated in, in live action workshops, um, they can be uh, a challenge under normal conditions. So uh, we'll, we'll see how well our host deals with that. Fourth point is, is a collective sense making moving forward, and uh, not to get too academic here, but uh, sense making is a, is a term of art coined by uh, uh, organizational psychologist Carl Weick um, to describe this, this sort of situation that we're confronting right now, which is seemingly obvious issue, uh, utility disconnects uh, being perceived in, in a variety of different ways, um, and the, the data really will spell that out. So the idea here is that we get a collective identity, a collective sense of sense making moving forward to allow a more transparent and uniform um, metric. This also means resetting the data. Uh, so, you know, moving forward that that everybody's on the same page and uh, this becomes an apples to apples comparison. Importantly, uh, to, to get it out right in front, uh, no fault, no blame. Uh, and I, I really want to emphasize that, um, you know, what's in the past is in the past. Um, by default and just the nature of this process, we're going to be looking at historical data. And, and sometimes that historical data uh, will have a lot of noise. And that, that really is the, the whole point behind this exercise is, is to point out that noise and to try to, to make it more finite. And what I mean by that is to find that signal, to, to find the answers that, that we're looking for. Uh, so no fault, no blame in this sense is, I've got an asterisk there because I can only really speak for myself in this matter, but uh, usually I'm probably the um, public enemy number one in terms of, of calling other people out on this. So uh, at least for me, um, I, utilities you know, can, can expect not to you know, be called out on uh, any historical transgressions that, that might have occurred with the data analysis. You really, the, the idea here is that we, we all come to a collective agreement as to how to make things better moving forward. And finally, you know, it's become seemingly obvious to me and internally with, with our discussions here at OPC that, um, and based off of the comments that we've received from the utilities to date, uh, that this might be a prelude to a potential Chapter 13 reboot. Now, I can imagine some people cringing in their seats at the moment of the idea of, of opening up a, a Chapter 13 um, billing, you know, rulemaking. Uh, but as we put forward the 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 proposed rules in this docket, uh, we didn't assign it to a particular chapter. We left it open ended, in part to to solicit feedback. Um, obviously, Chapter 13 makes the most sense. Um, one of the, the problems that we inherently face um, is with definitions and that a lot of the definitions uh, are different and or modified or and in, in some cases maybe even contradict existing definitions in chapter 13 if it were to move forward so that's that's going to be an interesting process as an aside I'll, I'll make the observation that that our chapter 13 rules um, don't address a lot of emerging technology um, that we're, we're currently starting to, to struggle with uh, as, as regulators, as advocates. Um, and I'm speaking primarily to uh, AMI, uh, advanced metering infrastructure, uh, time of use rates and so forth. Um, it, we've evolved quite a bit uh, since the last time we've looked at those chapter 13 rules. And, you know, of, of course, what we need is, is another rulemaking docket, but um, we, we're probably at some point need to take a serious look at, at looking at the entire Chapter 13 rules. But not today. Today, we're going to talk, we're going to begin our discussion uh, about the 2019 Naruk resolution, which was um, put forward just, well, approximately a year ago today, um, less than one day of a year ago. The resolution, and, and I apologize uh, ahead of time for having to read um, the next couple of slides, but, but I, I do think it's crucially important just to start this whole talk off by reiterating why we're here and why this exercise is so important. 
Um, the resolution on best practices and data collection and reporting for utility services, delinquencies, and payments and disconnections service. So highlights, and again, I'm not going to read the entire resolution, but, but highlights do include, whereas households with annual incomes at or below $30,000 have energy burdens two to four times as large as households that make in excess of $30,000. Whereas funding to assist lower income households pay their energy bills is insufficient to meet the need with funding available from the Federal Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program, or LIHEAP, is able to assist only about 6.1 million, or about one-fifth of the eligible households with an average annual grant of $458 during a federal fiscal year, the last federal fiscal year of 2018. Whereas low-income households often postpone other important purchases, even in some cases going without food or foregoing medical or dental care in order to pay utility bills or suffer illness in an effort to lower those bills by reducing their usage of heating and cooling energy to what can be unhealthy levels. Whereas Naruka and Nasuka recognize the value of evidence-based policy making to improve outcomes for both utilities and customers, and Whereas data collection and sharing plays an integral role in providing information for developing evidence-based policies, now therefore be it resolved that the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners convened at its annual meeting in San Antonio, Texas, encourages all interested parties to study and consider implementing best practices to help reduce the incidence of and minimize the negative impacts on utility service, payment delinquencies, and disconnections and take into consideration and explore the following actions. To work toward, to standardize the terms used to discuss delinquencies and disconnections and definitions of those terms, including at a minimum, the terms disconnection, reconnection, displacement, meaning a customer once disconnected, he does not ever reconnect his service at the same address. Vulnerable customers, and critical medical needs customers. To work to standardize the data collected insofar as that is practical, in order to facilitate state comparisons and track progress towards reducing these problems. To describe and implement best practices related to data collection regarding delinquencies and disconnections to seek input regularly from consumers and the agencies and organizations that work with consumers so that utility companies and regulators continue to be apprised of evolving customer needs and preferences. To consider implementing quality audits and data governance practices to ensure the information collected and reported is valid and reliable. To the extent permissible under, a federal, state, under federal and state laws, Collect and share data for research purposes while ensuring privacy of personal, personally identifiable information. To work to identify and share best practices that demonstrate promise to reduce delinquencies and disconnections with the explicit goal of increasing customers' capabilities to pay utility bills over time, including best practices that identify and highlight access to helpful programs and services, including bill affordability programs such as discount rates, or percentage of payment income payment plans, energy efficiency programs and services, weatherization, consumer education, expanding existing shutoff protections, custom payment plans that reflect the ability of the customer to successfully complete the payment plan, and flexible bill due dates. To train employees of utilities and services service agencies to assist assess and work with customers on sustainable solutions to avoid arrearages and maintain utility services. To work with stakeholders, including companies, to collect and share data on arrearages and disconnections. Share information about best practices with all interested parties and work on continuous improvement in policies and programs designed to help reduce delinquencies and disconnections. And be it further, Resolve that states should consider requiring utilities to, one, collect monthly data that tracks uncollectibles, 
number of payment arrangements, number of payment arrangement defaults, number of revised payment arrangements, disconnections, reconnections, duration and frequency of disconnections, and other relevant data points. Two, make the data publicly available on a monthly basis, delineated by general residential customers and those receiving low income assistance, and file the data with state public utility commissions to be published on the Public Utility Commission's website so that policymakers might have access to sufficient, objective, and granular data for forming public policy aimed at protecting the public health, safety, and welfare. So I'm going to pause real quick there and just reiterate the importance of, of that resolution. And um, as Commissioner Coleman referenced, uh, that discussion really uh, happened with, with a, a set of stakeholders with, with Naruk, with Nasuka, with the National Consumer Law Center, uh, and, and began in early of 2019 over the course of three webinars that were referenced. Uh, our office was tracking those webinars you know, from the onset, and we were solicited with, with a series of questions from the National Consumer Law Center to see how transparent our data was here in Missouri. Um, as a result of those conversations and our own investigation, that prompted us to, to, to file a motion for uh, opening up this workshop docket for AW 2020-0148, or approximately uh, six days after uh, that resolution was finalized at the San Antonio uh, annual meeting. The four questions we were asked that were asked of us by the National Consumer Law Center in early 2019 were as follows. Do utilities report the number of involuntary disconnects? Is that information publicly available? Have the number of disconnects reported by the utilities changed over time? And if yes, how have they changed? After thorough research, uh, looking at data that began in, in 2009, uh, for uh, utility annual reports uh, to, to present, uh, as well as uh, cold weather uh, rule rep monthly reporting rules uh, dating from 2013 onward, we concluded the following. That yes, we do have two periodic filings with the commission, both the annual reports and the monthly cold weather rule reports. Two, that that information is not easily accessible to the public and in some cases has been designated as confidential. Three, that the disconnection patterns vary considerably depending on the filing, the year, the utility type, and the company. For example, um, right now, uh, water utilities don't have to report any of this information. And four, based on the consolidated filings, there does not appear to be an agreed to standardization of data. That's that final point that is going to be the primary focus of this presentation to, to set the tone for both why we're here, but also, again, to, to make sense of, of what we're looking at when we look at that data and how to move forward. And again, we couldn't answer the questions, the four questions that were posed by the National Consumer Law Center. Again, why is standardized data important? Um, to hit home this point and to really beat it to death, quality, accessible, timely, and reliable data is needed to help with the measurement of sound utility performance. And without agreed to standardizations, widely different conclusions can be drawn and inappropriate policy responses may arise. If data is merely collected and never analyzed, compared or easily assessed, it loses its value. Past nine months underscores the importance of accurately conveyed data, accurately conveying data on the status of customer accounts. So what's happened between November 2019 and now? For those, and I know many people that I heard on, on the phone call have, are familiar with this graph, uh, our utility, COVID-19 utility uh, phone calls. Uh, one of the emails that is circulated on a, on a biweekly basis now is uh, the New York Times uh, daily reported new cases for COVID-related um, po positive cases. 
Uh, this is today's. As you can see, um, we're at 260,000, uh, close to 261,000, and uh, a, a large steep incline you know, of, of cases that we're currently facing. And to provide some context of what we've experienced over the past nine months, here's a history of cases throughout Missouri um, based off of the COVID exit strategy uh, data analysis. Uh, so citing for, you know, four levels of color there. So a dark red for uncontrolled spread to trending poorly, to caution warranted, to trending better. Uh, by looking at that, I'm not sure I see any green that's trending better. To provide a little context for what those colors actually mean, that dark red indicates that if cases are increasing more than 25% or 25% change during that 14 day period. For context purposes, uh, for utility uh, services and, and our COVID related calls, that's the period where we were looking at where we had a self-imposed disconnection moratorium in place. Approximately, uh, so some utilities I, I were earlier that that removed that disconnection moratorium earlier than that, and and in some cases uh, they went a little bit later than that. Uh, but but approximately, you're looking through uh, March, mid March through the first of August. Increasingly, one of the questions that that we're often that we often get, uh, and it really just underscores the support the importance of those COVID nineteen calls is. Uh, whether it's from the governor's office, uh, from the Department of Commerce and Insurance, uh, it's, you know, how are the utilities doing? Where are we at on disconnects? Where are we at on payment arrangements? Where are we at on arrearages? Uh, are we hitting a critical point or not? Uh, which again, just underscores the importance of having standardized data in place to be able to answer those questions. Now, I'd like to spend a little time talking about the data itself um, and what we were able to uncover. And, and I'm hoping that this will elicit at, at least some discussion, um, some sense-making discussion. Again, no fault, no blame. Um, we did receive a number of responses from utilities uh, and it, it just really wasn't practically feasible to go ahead and put all of the responses onto a PowerPoint. Uh, so. Uh, I, where, where appropriate, I, I will reference um, uh, specific utilities uh, responses, uh, but we'll see how this goes. And, and John, if you could flag me if, if anybody in, in, the, in the chat section has questions or, or wants to speak up, I think that's probably the best way to approach this is if, um, if, if a utility or a stakeholder does want to speak up, now is probably a good time to do that. All right. Oh, not yet. <laughs> Sense making of the data. So what is going on here? Uh, and this is, again, I guess just what I just said, audience, audience participation is welcomed. So here's a, a list of the cold weather rule. And I, I want to preface this by saying our memorandum that included the information uh, included data up until 2018. Uh, the, the data that I'm going to show you now is all publicly available data although not easily accessible publicly available data. That is, it's usually buried somewhere in, within EFIS. It's also 2019 data. So to, to underscore that point, we filed a rulemaking docket positing that there were issues with the data as it was currently being reported. A year later, we're seeing the same problems. And here's that, here are the, the 2019 uh, breakdowns. What you're looking at here is uh, on the electric side. We'll start with the electric. Um, again, if we're, if we're listening a question here as to what is the overall health of, of the utility in terms of consumers for involuntary disconnects, what we've got here is the cold weather rule um, and a huge difference between Amber, Missouri and uh, Evergy. 
this is just the cold weather rule. This is uh, the, the 12 months um, added up in each, each additional month uh, put there. If we were to look at the same numbers on the gas side, this is what we get broken down at. So the question is, is what do these numbers represent? And that's that's a good question. Um, we, <laughs> what do these numbers represent? Um, uh, Jeff, they're, yes. You have uh, several questions here. Can you get a quick, a quick explanation as to what the column headers mean for each one of these graphs? Yes. Uh, so the. The, the first column is, are the utilities themselves uh, broken up both in electric and gas? Uh, the second column is broken down as, as residential accounts. So not commercial, not industrial accounts, just residential accounts and across those, each of those utilities. Those are the number of accounts? That's correct. The third column is the cumulative monthly numbers reported on the cold weather rule. And the fourth is the percentage of cold weather rule disconnections relative to residential accounts. And when you say the so, cumulative number, I'm sorry to interrupt again, the cumulative number no, please. in the 2019 CWR column, those are reported as disconnections? Correct. If one were just to go off of just the, the CWR data analysis, um, we would have a very different narrative taking place between at least our electric utilities and, and what's taking place. The next graphic that you're going to look here is the second set of data over the same time period. And this is confined to just involuntary disconnections. The one difference that I would posit here um, is its total accounts. So this includes both residential, commercial, and industrial. Involuntary disconnects, as I've interpreted it based off of the feedback that I've received from the utilities is, uh, this is services that have been um, discontinued due to non-payment or keeping up with uh, your overall bill. Again, uh, the first column is the utilities. The second column is the total accounts across that utility, commercial, industrial, and residential. The third column is the total involuntary disconnections reported. And finally, that percentage. You'll note that these numbers are very different than what we see in the um, cold weather rule. And even accounting for the difference between residential versus all customer accounts, uh, the, the gap is, is too large to account for. So less than 1% for Amherst, Missouri, for example, uh, but uh, much higher in this case for Evergy, uh, 8% and 5% respectively. And in some of the case, uh, th there were no involuntary disconnects. Jeff, I feel like I'm missing something. This is Annika. So on the on the previous slide, there were 280,000 disconnections, but is that a different population that we're looking at here? Like, where did the all those disconnections go? I don't know. Um, that that's I guess that that's the rub. Um, I can tell you that Annika, that that the first count first set of columns that we showed are just residential accounts. The second set are involuntary accounts. So these are these are shutoffs that are confined to uh, non-payment. I'm going to show you a third set here in a second that is, is not involuntary, but it's voluntary shutoffs. So the, the, the key difference here is that um, you know, if uh, getting a, an illustrative example of voluntary shutoff would be moving. Yeah, I'm moving homes and I want to discontinue my service.
And again, all of this information, again, is, is, is publicly available, and we, we provided the 2018 numbers in our memo. Uh, here are voluntary disconnections. As we come through this data, you know, it elicited a number of questions on our end, you know, not only that if, if that it, it appears just eyeballing this, that utilities are approaching this differently in, in how they are, are, are coding their data, um, giving them the benefit of the doubt that that's what that's what's taking place here and that these aren't an, an accurate, you know, apples to apples comparison. So if we were to combine both the voluntary and involuntary disconnects, so these are the total disconnections reported in the annual report, we get the following numbers. Jeff, before you go on, we have a question. Um, are the cold weather rule disconnections considered neither voluntary nor involuntary, but a third category altogether? That is my understanding, but confined to residential. So the, the, the theme here, what, what should you take away, what should be the takeaway from these, these points? Um, I mean, one, on a very, very simple level, the, what's being reported on, in the annual reports is different than what's being reported in the cold weather reports. Uh, and it's more pronounced than just chalking it up to, well, the cold weather reports are residential and the annual reports are everybody else. There's also, more than likely an issue of, of, of double counting being present at work here. And I'd point to Average Metro is probably a prime example of that. If what you're what we're looking at here in part is is a bit of a of a moving target, right? So in theory you could have you know a customer that gets disconnected or an account that gets disconnected more than once a year. And it could be several times. Um, there's also issues of how we're defining an account. Um, that's my assumption anyway, and, you know, I'm, I'm definitely welcome to feedback from the utilities on this. Uh, but if I were to eyeball, say, 45% uh, disconnection rate for one utility, um, that seems unusually high. The delta between 45% and 5%, I guess, is, is large, and it's large enough where if this was an apples to apples comparison and everything was on the level, uh, I would venture to say that, you know, we would need to be ex examining why that is the case. We would need to explore, um, you know, really what's driving these numbers. I wanna pause there. John, any additional questions? Not at the moment, but I open up if anybody else would like to bring up something. This would be a good time. John, this is Jermaine Greffs from Ara, Missouri. May I speak? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yes, please. Okay. Please. Thank yes. you. I, I was just wondering, um, this information is kind of hitting us cold. So I was just wondering, is there a chance for this to maybe be filed in the docket and then an opportunity for us to, you know, explore this internally and respond maybe in writing. I think for us, that might be the best approach. Jermaine, that's, that, 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 that's absolutely appropriate. If the companies would prefer, I'm not sure that's necessary for us to even file it. If you just want to, let us look over it and uh, get back to us in writing. Um, again, as Jeff has already indicated, this is, we're not, no fault, no blame. We're just trying to make uh, an understand of this at this point in time. Understood. And I was just, have you emailed this out? Uh, I was trying to take notes, but want to make sure that we capture it correctly. So I guess, will you email this presentation out separately? Yes. Hey, this is Contessa. 
Is there opposition to um, actually filing this in the docket for some reason? Because for those who, who aren't able to participate today and perhaps they'd like to see this presentation, it seemed like putting it in the case would be, you know, that would be good for them to be able to see it. So I don't know. I didn't mean to have opposition to filing it. I was hoping that potentially if uh, it was more conducive to uh, a dialogue for people to talk uh, offline, so to speak, but I don't believe that we have any problem with, um, sorry, if I'm, I don't think we have a problem with uh, filing this presentation. Okay, this is this is Contessa again. Uh, thanks, John. I just I just was wanting some clarity on that because it's not uncommon for us to you know put presentations um, in the docket with these rulemaking cases. So, all right, thanks. I, I agree, Contessa. Uh, we'd, we'd be happy to do that. Uh, the, the the numbers. Uh, I, you know, I, I will say that we provide it right now in in the docket, and uh, if you go to the very be the the initial filing of this docket, we provided an Excel spreadsheet that contains uh, data for 2009 through 2018. Um, we could also file in John. I've got no problem doing this. We could we could revise it and add the 2019 numbers uh, that we have to date. So you can go, you know. I guess 10 months, you know, more information uh, and the 2019 numbers. So that's all, all of this information is consistent with what we saw last year when we filed our notice. And completely understand, you know, if, if utilities would, would rather be quiet and, and have a chance to kind of absorb this or think about it, um, you know, I, I'd ask uh, for some uh patients on our end you know in an ideal world we would have had more resources available and had gotten this powerpoint out to you uh in you know two weeks in advance uh, unfortunately our office is uh a bit strained at the moment and uh, a lot of this was thrown together this morning all right it's underscore you know again why this is such a timely issue and, and how unfortunate it was that um, COVID happened when it did. Uh, here are a, a number of questions that, again, we're continuously asked as an office. Um, are disconnections a problem? Are arrearages a problem? And should we have a disconnection moratorium? Now, to date, we, we've largely relied on this COVID-19 calls uh, to kind of guide us in, in, in determining, you know, any sort of policy position moving forward. Uh, but Nonetheless, uh, the, the concern here is, you know, if if a prolonged COVID extension uh, might create additional problems. I, you've referenced noise a few times in the data, um, and, and really what I mean by noise is I'm talking about um, uh, information that is, you know, misleading, confusing, or otherwise doesn't paint an accurate picture of, of, of what's going on. So noise in the data has been a consistent problem and will likely prove to be a challenge in making sound recommendations if conditions continue to, to deteriorate due to COVID-19. So what have we seen in publicly reported data to date during COVID-19? Um, so again, this is all publicly available information. And what I'm gonna show you now is each utility's COVID-19, well, I guess 2020, cold weather rule data. There you go. So for KCPL or for Evergy Metro, this is these are the numbers that are being reported for um, to date for this year. Uh, looking at those numbers, you know, two things should jump out at you. Uh, one, that they are lower than they were in the previous year. Uh, but not considerably lower. Uh, and the number of disconnects, again, are, are in the hundreds on, on a month-to-month -month basis related to non-energy assistance. Um, Evergy is actually the, the one utility that does break it down between non-energy assistance and energy assistant um, customers. 
in my position, you know, I, I really feel like I'm paid to be skeptical and, and to, to ask questions. Um, if you're looking at this data, there should be one thing, one additional bit of information that should jump out at you uh, that, that should at least solicit a question. And if you picked the disconnection moratorium, you're right. So we were in a disconnection, a self-imposed disconnection moratorium roughly uh, from March until August for most of our utilities. Uh, eyeballing this, the question that I would ask is, why were we having disconnects during months where there was a disconnection moratorium in place? And I know Evergy Metro is first in line there, but it's actually pretty consistent across all utilities. And here we look at Evergy West or the so old Chemo utility. Yeah. Hey, Jeff, this is Julie Dragu. Can you just hey, give Julie. us a quick lowdown on where this data came from? I think, it, did it? Did you have it noting the annual report? Like, is it our no. corporate annual report? No, no, no. Um, to, 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 to clarify, there's two sets of data. Uh, that, that we're relying on. These are two sets of data where we have disconnection data reported to the commission. The first is in the utilities annual report. It's usually filed in the spring of each year, uh, representing the, 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 the previous year. Uh, so those are just filed in EFIS. It's along with uh, uh, various SEC information, um, overall revenues earned. This information is just cold weather rule reporting data. It's just EFIS related monthly data that we get. Hmm. Okay, yeah, I think it looks new new to us, at least for those of us that are on the phone. So we'll, we'll have to circle back internally. Yep. Okay. Yep, thanks. Thank you, Julie. Here's Amber in Missouri. Again, um, you know, the, the, the question that we'd ask is, uh, you know, are all these disconnects that are taking place, are these, are these just movers? Um, you know, in, if I'm extrapolating from this data, and I would say, well, if the 2020 data was just people that were moving, those are voluntary disconnects, then the 2019 data as a proxy would include some involuntary disconnects. Just eyeballing that, um, that's a small number. That's a small number, especially for, for a utility that, that has over a million customers. And maybe that's the case. Uh, but it, it, it is not consistent with what we're seeing across all of the utilities. And here's Empire and Liberty. And this is on the electric side. Again, we're seeing disconnects during those months, um, but they're also slightly below what you've seen um, in 2019. Stated differently, if I didn't know COVID-19 was taking place in 2020, I might not think there was a you know something unusual taking place in 2020, just looking at this data. For example, June had more disconnects in, in 2020 than it did in, in uh, 2019. This is Amber in Missouri for gas. Hey, Jeff. This is yes. Christopher Galliano at Spire. So you ask us the question, are these voluntary disconnects? And I, I you know, we're at Spire, we're kind of looking at that right now and seeing if we can figure that out. But but I, I wanted to ask you, and what was the original intent of the question of the reporting? What was the original intent of the PSC for us utilities to put, to send for just, you know, a general word disconnects? Because it could be voluntary disconnects. I, I think it is, Chris. Uh, that, I, I would agree with you. I think it is voluntary disconnects is how I would read the cold weather report. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, on a on a very similar note, somebody asked if it was possible that neither of the years that you're uh, 2020 or 2019 include any involuntary disconnects. 
It, it could. Um, and here, here's the problem with doing something on a on a PowerPoint. Uh, and I'm, I don't know. I'm, I'm struggling with whether or not to open up the Excel spreadsheet and and go through that. Maybe if I go through the rest of this PowerPoint, I, I can show you. If let's let's go with that assumption. Let's say that the cold weather re report doesn't contain any involuntary disconnects, which right away that kind of gives me pause because. When I think about the cold weather report, I think the impetus behind that is to help those most in need. So the data that I would want to know is those most in need being impacted. So I, I question sort of the logic of if this data just contains voluntary but not involuntary disconnect. But really, I'm, 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 I, I'm sitting here with, with a larger question mark on my end. I don't know. Um, other than I, I just don't see, I struggle with, with trying to find, um, to, to answer those basic questions as to exactly how many people were disconnected and for, for what or, or why. Um, I saw a question from Stacy, but, but I can't access that. Could you repeat that for me, John? Uh, did the ask for 2019 include voluntary disconnects? That would be logical. The number for 2019 would be under, understated. Can you hear me? I, I can't hear you. Okay, good. Um, so, right, so, yeah, Jeff, put a, yeah. put a little differently. Um, it would make sense that voluntary disconnects may not have been tracked in the 2019 data. And then we're looking at 2020 data that's almost purely voluntary. So where it appears there's no delta, it's because we're apples and grapes not even oranges. That's that, that, that's, that, that's a good, um, I think that that's a good hypothesis. Um, and you know what, Stacey, what I'll do, as soon as we finish this, let's just open up all of the CWR data and let, let's see if that's, that's the case. Uh, so we can look at uh, the data from 2018, 2017, 16, 15, 14, so on, and see if we're, you're, you're really seeing a, a big number difference. Uh, I'll just go through the rest, just to be fair. Here's Empire Gas. This is Liberty Gas. And here's Spire, Missouri. I've got I got it broken down both Laclede and MGE. And Summit. So I will say that uh you know the my knee jerk reaction of looking at this is for the cold weather report was probably expecting to see something more like summits numbers where there were zeros there. there, were there, zero, there. In a disconnection moratorium. Hey, Jeff, this is Christopher again at Spire. Would you go back to hours? I think it was right before this one. There you go, Chris. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I, I think we we included both last year, and then this year it's just the volunteers for those months. Okay. Yeah. I and that 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 is definitely helpful. I, that's my guess. Now, I, 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 that's just a guess at looking at this. We'd have to go and tie that back out and make sure. And you can see where that that causes us some some heartburn on our end when we're trying to make sense of what's going on, right? Mm -hmm. um, let's, let, let's assume that that is the case. Uh, I, think, I think you're probably right. And I think what you're seeing is that a lot of, of utilities are reporting it differently. There's probably a, a rational reason for reporting it the way they are. Uh, it's just not entirely obvious to us. And it's not entirely obvious when we look at that data over the course of say, a decade. 
And again, the, the memo articulated in and sort of cherry picked some really highlighted um, abnormalities in the data. Um, you know, I'd, I'd encourage everybody to look over again because uh, I, I think I'd try to find something for at least everybody. Um, all right. This is summit. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry, Jermaine. Yes. Yes, I was wondering, could you scroll back to the Ameren Missouri Electric information? There you go. Okay, so I'm looking at uh, an excerpt from our cold weather rule report. And so it, it does have from April that 13,178, but right under that it says of those disconnected, how many customers had service discontinued for non-payment during the period and we have zero. So I think, you know, that we'll get back to you with further details, but I'm thinking similarly that, um, you know, we, we do identify which ones are for non-payment versus, you know, the voluntary disconnects here. Thanks, Jermaine. And I, I think that's what we, that makes sense. Um, so I think we've got an answer there. Um, and that's, that, yep. You know, we got this recorded so we can always play it back. But my guess was is that the difference between the 2019 and 2020 numbers was the involuntary disconnect. And if that's the case for every utility, um, I guess that raises other questions um, because a lot of these months there are no, or are we suggesting that there were no involuntary disconnects? Um, I don't know. Um, or if, if we are talking involuntary disconnects, then we're talking a very, 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 very small number of customers, uh, even accounting for those months where there was a disconnection moratorium. All right. Um, actually, this is, Let's talk about uh, additional questions that, you know, whether or not we have time to, to, to tackle this today. Um, when we get to the rulemaking uh, today, uh, uh, we solicited both feedback within EFIS initially, uh, but we also sent out individual surveys to the companies where we posited a, a series of hypothetical questions and, or just clarifying questions based off of those initial responses. Uh, we, we we hear you, and there are, are things that we have are reconsidering in, in how we drafted our rules. That um, at the end of the day, you know, we, we agree that might be too onerous for the utilities to take. And we, I, I guess, in short, we want to make this as seamless as possible. We want to get everybody on the same page as possible, uh, and we want to eliminate as many duplicative reportings as possible. Uh, so. One of the questions is, you know, how do you report LIHEAP and external funding? If you re re remember back to that NARUC resolution, uh, one of the points within that resolution was to, uh, to the extent possible, highlight uh, third-party funding sources, whether that's LIHEAP, whether that's, say, the United Way or some other charity, um, and its impact in terms of uh, low-income customers. So being able to carve out low-income customers relevant to the the non-low income customers. The feedback we got is that there, you know, there might be considerable um, dollars involved with uh, your CSR um, billing software uh, or not. So that's one issue. Um, how to deal with plant shutoffs and safety disconnections. We got a, a considerable amount of, of feedback from Spire Missouri over this issue um, and we agree that we, we don't really have an answer and, and we're, this is part of that sense-making process. So whether or not you're counting a voluntary disconnect as somebody whose power or gas is shut off, uh, say for the day, if there's road work taking place, uh, so a planned maintenance outage or, or so forth, you know, how is that codified in your, how is that put into your data? 
I referenced this earlier, but the issue of double counting, um, you know, with the feedback we've got, and I can tell you, and again, I'm not going to go ahead and, and, and point out all the utilities and, and their responses on this, but other than just to, to say they're different and how some utilities are labeling a customer account um, and are, are is different than, than others in, in how we define disconnects. So uh, what I mean by that, a customer could have one address, but uh, or six addresses, but one account, or there might be multiple people within an, in, an, in an account, right? How to deal with collections. Uh, the Naruk resolution uh, also referenced this. Uh, you know, we we raised the issue uh, with with survey questions, um, and uh, interestingly enough, I guess on my end. Uh, the utilities definitely have very different collection processes, uh, and in some cases, multiple, in most cases, multiple collection agencies at work uh, that function in different capacities. How to deal with pay plans, budget billing, uh, payment arrangements. Uh, again, the resolution called for that. Uh, whether or not that's something that ultimately makes the cut for our rules, um, I'm open to feedback. Uh, but especially within the context of COVID, I realized that utilities are offering more payment plans than they probably ever have to date. So how to account for that? Well, on the flip side, I will say a lot of this um, is already being done. Um, I, I think with, with the utility reporting through the COVID and the, the other AW docket that we do have open right now. Uh, again, how do we minimize reporting? And then a look at the drafted rules. Uh, before we go to the rules themselves, I just want to, to highlight um, our expectations, you know, moving forward with today. We're going to take a break here pretty soon, um, maybe a 15-minute break at, at the 3.15 mark. Um, we'll come back at 3.30. We're clearly not going to get through the rules today. Um, this is a real, you know, trial by error uh, endeavor, you know, that we put forward with this virtual rulemaking. Uh, internally, you know, what we had discussed was actually reaching out to individual utilities and, and having a, dis a frank discussion with each one of you uh, about your data. Uh, and then setting up a, a future meeting in the first quarter of 2021 where we're able to go ahead and look at, um, you know, wherever we finish off today and, and to follow up. But that would also give you the everybody an opportunity to kind of look back at their data and figure out how does their data you know, compare to everybody else's um, in, and how are you reporting it internally um, to the commission? All right, uh, any questions before we break? Thank you, hopefully that wasn't too painless uh, or painful. Uh, <laughs> I, um, We'll we'll come back at the 3:30 mark, um, and uh, we'll we'll open up uh, uh, the drafted rules, and we'll see if we get any feedback. And if if we need more time and we need to end early today, that's that's fine too. All right, John. I believe, as uh, Jeff said, I think we're going to take a short break here. Is there any concern with us reconvening at 3.30? No concerns. Pardon? No concerns from Spire. Oh, thank you. Sorry. John, shall we just stay on the line, or do we need to call back in? Uh, I'm going to pause the recording, but I'm going to leave this call open uh, and then actually probably step out of this. So I would just stay on the call if you can, if that's available, uh, if you're willing to do so. Thanks. All right. I'm going to pause the recording now and we will uh, pick back up at 3.30. All right. I have uh, resumed the recording. I have 3.30 by my computer's clock. So I believe we're ready to pick back up. Um, yes, okay. 
so as far as the itinerary that the uh, OPC had originally proposed, the um, first sort of half of this workshop was going to be dedicated to uh, Dr. Mark's presentation and kind of review of the issue and the discussions that we've had so far. The uh, second half, we were going to try and focus in on uh, some of the comments and questionnaire answers that we had gotten back from the companies, some of the feedback that had already been solicited, and uh, proceed from there. And I believe we're going to focus on uh, the comments provided by Spire Missouri, which uh, were some of the most robust. Not that we won't potentially touch on some of the other comments, but before we do that, um, there was a question regarding the cold weather rule uh, that um, Dr. Mark wanted to have an opportunity to kind of show uh, at a broader level some of the metrics that were uh, employed by the OPC in developing its data sets. So, uh, Dr. Mark, if you are uh, prepared to share your screen. I am. Um, I let's see if this works. Can you see that? I believe so. Okay. So what what everybody should be seeing on their screen is a look at uh, Amherst, Missouri's uh, disconnects. Uh, these are cold weather, and let me start off by saying, uh, Stacy, if you're on, this is uh, in reference to your question um, earlier about whether or not the, the 2020 data is just vol voluntary disconnects. Um, here, what we're looking at is at least the last uh, five years of cold weather rule data. Um, and you can just kind of eyeball that and see that um, the cold weather rule, I mean, for 2020 is a little bit lower than they otherwise would be for, for the other years, but but not significantly. Uh, I'm sorry, this is for Ameren Gas. Here's Ameren Electric. And again, this is all publicly available information. These are just the, the 12 months of, of cold weather rule reported data. You can contrast that with uh, Evergy Metro. So, you know, if you were looking at this, we could say uh, May of 2020, there were 168. There was 404 in 2019. There was zero in 2018, 402, 674. So under, you know, your, your hypothesis there, that might be right. You, you could say, uh, accounting for that ab ab anomaly in, in 2018, Maybe May is just looking at it, that voluntary, not involuntary. Uh, but if you open up that data set, you know, across those months, you, you are going to find some suspect uh, numbers. Again, there's uh, um, Evergy West, Empire, pretty consistent, you know, 2,000 to, to 3,000 a month. Uh, Empire Gas, Liberty, and you know, just to, when you look at all of the numbers combined uh, between the two data sets, in some years we'll have more cold weather rule disconnects than we will reported in total in the annual reports. So I, at that point, I kind of throw my hands up in the air and, and I don't know what's going on. Um, all right, so uh, hopefully that, I don't know if anybody had any questions on what I'm showing. All right, I will now open it to uh, the rules. Hopefully this will work. John, I'm, I'm looking at you. Can you see that? We're, I'm still seeing an Excel file. Okay. All right. One second. Stop share. I'm try to share again. How about now? 
Those are the proposed rules. Oh, sorry, okay. Spire's comment. No, no, those are proposed rules. Nope, there's Spire's comments again. I got it. Apologies. In fact, they're both. They're proposed rules. They're, they're Spire's comments to the proposed rules. And uh, so I want to thank Spire for, for providing such robust comments. Uh, we really do appreciate it. Um, and we're also, you know, be, we show our appreciation. We're going to volunteer you uh, as sort of the sacrificial lamb to, to put this up. Uh, and hopefully, you know, we could use your questions. You can explain your rationale with it. Um, and then if anybody else has additional comments they want to make, uh, this is really the sausage making process of rulemaking that we're talking about now. Uh, now is a good opportunity as ever. Uh, again, we, we do plan on having a, another one of these rulemaking uh, workshops in, in the first quarter of 2021. Uh, but here we go. Uh, so the, the first section is uh, the purpose of the rule. Um, and what's listed there is a affordability payment plan shall mean a commission approved plan approved at the utilities option in which a customer provides for the payment of any outstanding delinquent charges accrued to that customer for regulated utility services as a condition of receiving continued services. I'm going to pause real quick here if anybody's curious where we came up with these rules. Uh, in, in short, uh, a hodgepodge of, of different states um, is, is the, the short answer of that. But uh, we, we looked to see where best practices were uh, with, with other utilities that had been cited uh, or other state commissions that had been cited. And uh, we, we leaned on those largely to help us develop the draft rules. So uh, Spire, uh, his comments, uh, believes that it could be better defined. And, and it's difficult to know if a customer's specific plan arrangement was established to avoid succession of continued services unless the company looks at the age of debt, late fees, severance at the time the payment arrangement was created for the service addressed. Uh, Chris or, or Brian, um, I'm going to pause here. If, if you guys want to expand a little bit on your filed comments, um, I, I, and I'll just tee up a little bit more, you know, the, the issue here, as I understand it, is that Spire has many different payment plans. Correct. And then just really, this is Brian, um, then trying to identify, did they set up this plan just to to continue their services? So they could have also set up these this plan as well if they don't, if, does that mean they were really in the disconnect process, meaning they, they're they're just behind their bills or are they actually in the disconnect process where they're receiving the initial letter, the 96 letter? What really constitutes as, you know, setting these up to continue service? You could just be behind on your bill as well, knowing that that's that the following month, you might be in the disconnect process and you're calling in advance. So really just trying to define when we would say that a customer is really trying to continue their services. Okay, uh, Brian, I'm just gonna keep going with you here. We, we've teed this up as an affordability payment plan. Uh, would you say you can have non-affordability payment plans or is every payment plan by default an affordability plan? Well, I, I guess that's tough to answer. Let me just throw this out, Jeff, and tell me like as far as like just a general payment plan that we'll always offer all the time, is paying a percentage of your account balance and then okay. out the remainder of your balance over the next three months or so. So knowing that we do that all the time, can I kind of throw the question back at you? Yeah. Um, does any, uh, do you, any other utilities have any thoughts on this? I'll pause here. John, are we getting any feedback? Okay. So just to, to reiterate, you know, the, the, the question posed here, um, you could have a number of different types of payment plans. Is this something that we, we, we need to record? Is this something? Um, so and not that we have to adhere word for word to the NARUC resolution, um, but the idea behind this is to get more finite information. One of the questions that, that we struggle with when, whenever utility comes in for a rate case, um, on my end that, that I try to address is, well, 
are the policies and procedures that are in place today, are they working? And one of the questions we ask, for example, budget billing uh, or payment plans, uh, which no doubt are, are, are a big issue right now with COVID-19, uh, but are they designed appropriately and are they working? Um, so my, 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 my default answer to you, Brian, is I, I, I guess I would like to know um, the information. Um, I would like to know what payment plans a utility is offering and how many customers are, are participating in that. Um, but what I'm hearing is that that, uh, at least the definition as it's articulated right now can be better defined. Correct. I don't know what it is. Um, Jeff, this is Stacy. Um, so one of the ways we've sort of compartmentalized payment plans in terms of where we are today and where we were in the past, you would um, you might have a high use payment plan. Someone had a leak, something like that, where we forgive a portion of their balance and or um, allow them to pay their balance off over a shorter period of time, like the folks that from Spire were just talking about. Whereas with um, what we're finding with the current balances that have accrued over the, the months of the pandemic, particularly coming from other states, we're being required to offer a longer period of time for customers of, of varying length. So in some states, we're being required to give customers two years to pay off balances that were accrued during COVID. So I think some type of definition around causation, whether it's um, high use health, global pandemic, <laughs> you know, right, might right. be helpful. Thank you. I'm, I'm writing all this down. I really do appreciate the, the feedback. Uh, any other utility comment? This is Jermaine Grubbs on behalf of Amra, Missouri. I guess just looking at our comments, we, we did try to sync both of these up with the defined terms in Chapter 13, right, for payment agreements and settlement agreements, and not sure how that will jive with this then. That's a good point, Jermaine. Thank you. You know, and to, to provide some perspective here, I mean, what's what's the final deliverable product going to look like here? Um, you know, in, in keeping with, with the concept of, of just having a, a transparent process and as much as possible in apples to apples analysis, um, the utilities would be reporting on a monthly basis, but an actual report would be developed and, and due on an annual basis that would compile everybody's information. Uh, so. I, I could see, you know, where the current rules talk about payment and settlement, uh, you know, as articulated, you know, some 20 plus years ago. And over that time, we've evolved a lot in terms of the, the type of affordability payments or, or just payment plans that we have. Uh, so points points taken and we'll, we'll definitely take that under advisement uh, and adapt accordingly. A any other comments before I move on? Yeah, okay. this is Julie Dragu. Hey, Jeff, this is Julie Dragu. Sorry. Um, just a, a comment from our perspective, just sort of how we're, you know, we're tracking um, payment agreements and things like that. Um, I I can't remember who just made the comment of, you know, wanting to define what each of them means. Um, I don't know that we have that correct granularity of detail. You know, we track a cold weather arrangement, but then to that example, we could have a, an arrangement for folks who had a billing correction or, um, you know, some of these COVID arrangements or just a flexible arrangement for folks who need that opportunity, um, kind of like what was mentioned before. So um, would really like to understand if, if we try to get too granular, that might be a challenge. Julie, I 100% uh, agree and it, I think uh, as a compromise, we might just have, um, you know, to, to me, budget billing seems like an obvious one, uh, but um, 
we, we can look at that and, and maybe there's just a category for other uh, if, if we do elect off at, at the end of the day move forward with this with this particular uh, yes. suggestion. Okay. Okay. Uh, B, uh, budget billing. Um, so it, it's the budget billing payment plan shall mean a commission approved plan offered at the utilities option in which a customer pays. So right away, you know, budget billing has been uh, given its own designation as a rule. Uh, definition here. Um, Spire's comments again. Um, Spire offers three different budget plans, uh, both general, cold weather rule, and fixed charge assistance program. Clarification on which of these plans would fall under that definition would be beneficial. Uh, Brian, if, if, if I read this correctly, would you say that, that, that Spire then does not have just a, an average plan? Well, we do. That would be the general. So like when it's that very Got first it. point, so general would just be a normal standard budget. Got it. Okay. Julie, uh, if, if I'm going to put you on the spot, because my understanding is that Evergy has, has a unique budget billing arrangement with, with their computer GIS system. Meaning, yeah, so we would, we have our bid budget billing plan. I think it's an average payment plan. Um, you know, and cold weather rule would be, would be different. Okay. Um, so, okay, point, point taken. Uh, we will definitely clarify what we mean by, by budget billing. Um, and I, in this case, it would fall under, I guess, the general plan for Spire. I don't know if anybody else has uh, comments they'd like to make over this specific definition. Hey, Jeff, this is Brian again, just for clarification, just the amount calculated independent of the, the volume, really, you're not talking about the current months. That's where the budget comes in. But really, we would have to look at previous um, calculated volume to kind of come up what the budget plan should be for the next year. Just wanted to clarify on that. I am writing that down. Got it. Okay. Uh, number C or letter C, uh, bill shall mean uh, demand in writing or if agreed to by the customer and the utility in electric format for payment for utility services rendered or utility equipment supplied and associated taxes, surcharges, and franchise. Any comments on C? Okay. Uh, any comments on D? Billing period shall mean the normal period of utility service usage by a customer for which a bill is generated and which is not less than 26 nor more than 35 days for a monthly billed customer, nor more than 100 days for a quarterly billed customer. Uh, and if people don't, uh, again, you'll have more than enough opportunity to go ahead and respond. Hey, Jeff, uh, I'm going to cut in really quick. I'm trying to get a lot of feedback from people. Uh, I understand that we're cutting in and out here with conversation, but uh, if you can try and mute yourself when you're not speaking, that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, also, really quick, we got a, um, a comment from somebody who talked about the fact that the National Consumer Law Center just published a bill of rights for utility customers that proposed a percentage of income as a potential alternative billing plan. I'm, I believe that's going to come back under the, um, the budget billing definition, unless somebody wants to correct me or would like to speak up and, and, and discuss that more. There you go. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, when if, if for those that can't read it, she says that's what she was thinking. Um, so I appreciate that, and we can we can provide some uh, a link to that, some context. Uh, maybe I'm sure we can just go ahead and file that into EFIS as well as, as just a point of reference for people. 
Uh, e, and here we, we do have a comment from, from Spire. Uh, customer shall mean a person or a legal entity responsible for payment for a utility service except for any person or legal entity denoted as a guarantor. Um, and Spire writes, how would this definition account for multiple financially responsible uh, people on the account? For example, a husband is the main customer, spouse is the secondary customer. Um, would the account then be one or two customers, or is the secondary customer considered a guarantor as defined in G below? Great question. Um, Brian or, or Chris, again, what, what, what are your thoughts? How would you approach that? Um, hey, Jeff, how are you doing? This is Brian Patterson. I, I guess I would personally think that's, that's one customer, but that's my personal opinion. Okay. Um, opening it up, if, if does anybody else feel that that would not be, or does anybody, is any utility currently operating different than under under different assumption than that? Okay. Jeff, the, the only time um, that we handle that differently is if they're in dissolution and not yet divorced, but one okay. spouse is out of the household. Help me understand that, Stacey. So, uh, would it be would that be two customers then? Yes. Got as it. soon okay. as as soon as they, we do require documentation that it's being pursued, so it's not abused. Okay. I.e., we run up a big balance, and we generally ask them. We don't require them, but we ask them if there's any prior balance to assume half of it. Okay. And we've never been turned down. They're usually pretty, <laughs> pretty happy about that. <laughs> oh, good, good to know. Thank you. Okay, we'll, we'll move on to F. Um, the delinquent charge shall mean a charge for a regulated utility service that remains unpaid for at least 21 days for a monthly billed customer and at least 16 days by a quarterly billed customer from the date the utility issues the bill or charge remaining unpaid after the preferred payment date selected by the customer and agreed to by the utility. Uh, Spire writes, how does this definition match up to the current tariff definitions? How does it support current collection efforts? And do the charges described above include taxes? Okay. Um, how does this match up to the current, def current tariff definitions? I will say that the number of questions that we got from utilities on this, um, that uh, a number of the utilities relied on their tariff and the tariff definitions uh, do vary uh, between utilities. Uh, so that's something that we're gonna have to just to double check on our end. We're just gonna have to look at all the tariff, um, the tariffs themselves and look at the, uh, um, how different they are and whether or not um, it's compatible with, with the rule. I guess the short answer to this is we could expand the definition um, to include all of the, the tariff definitions uh, or le leave it general enough uh, to, to include that. I don't know, John, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, my only thought, and unfortunately I can't recall off the top of my head, but I was under the impression that this might've been one of the, uh, that this language might've been one of the ones that was adopted at least in part from existing definitions found in rule 13. And I'm not sure how that would interplay with the question. Um, but I would need to double check that. Okay. All right, I'll move on to G then. Uh, guarantor shall mean any person or legal entity who has executed a legally binding promise in writing to assume liability up to a specified amount for delinquent charges, which might accrue to a particular customer. Uh, Inspire rights clarification on the type of non-cash deposits. This includes would be uh, would be beneficial. So surety bonds, letters of credit, or third party deposits. Um, Brian, you want to uh, articulate a little bit more on, on this? Uh, help, help me understand this because this is outside of my. Uh, no, it was just really trying to clarify as far as is there anything else there that we're maybe missing that would be constituted as that. Um, so we were just trying to get a good definition. I think we could add all of that stuff. Uh, does, does, does anybody else feel that we're missing something there? Okay. okay. Uh, 
uh, H is an involuntary disconnection, and this is really a, an important one here. Um, and I am acutely aware that the current chapter rule definitions uh, have different terminology for this. Um, and that's that's a bridge we're going to have to cross at some point, whether it's a termination or discontinuance of service uh, versus involuntary versus voluntary disconnections. Uh, at, at this point, we're so early in this in this ball game that I am just going to go off of what we drafted here right now, and we, we can come back and circle on circle up on this in, in the first quarter. But what we drafted was an involuntary disconnection shall mean the succession of regulated utility services, whether completed remotely or by going to the premise to physically disconnect that is not undertaken at the request of the customer receiving service and includes any discontinuance of services defined in Chapter 13 of this title, but does not include any temporary disruption in the provision of utility services caused by forces outside the utility's control. Again, Spire wrote, would this definition include disconnections for safety purposes? Would it include disconnections for system maintenance or to meet regulatory requirements? I am hoping for some feedback on this. So what are we defining as involuntary disconnect? I would not define an involuntary disconnect as something for safety purposes um, or system maintenance to meet regulatory requirements. I'll, Brian, since you wrote it, did, do you have any other do you think differently? No, just really we were just trying to be clear because really when you think involuntary, you're thinking about for non-payment. And that's really what the clarification was. Is this really just involuntary due to non-payment or any involuntary? Because there are other involuntary, like you said, for safety. And we mentioned there as well, customer didn't ask for it. It was involuntary, but right. it's not related to non-payment. Okay. Um, 100% agree. Uh, I would venture to say this is really where uh, the commission and, and, you know, regulators and advocates really want to look at the most is, you know, the, the NARUC resolution really referenced and, and made an emphasis on, on low income customers. Um, so the, the issue over involuntary disconnect for, for non-payment is, is really the emphasis there. Uh, we, does anybody else feel differently about that? Whether, you know, whether or not we ultimately use the term involuntary disconnect, um, or what we call it, the, the point being that um, that subset of customers that are disconnected for, for non-payment. Um, any other feedback on that? I think, you know, from, a, from an energy perspective, defining that as, you know, involuntary due to, to non-payment Okay. You know, makes sense because there are, are a variety of other reasons, including, you know, um, theft and diversion um, and things like that. So, theft, diversion, safety. Um, yeah. I'm sure there's, there's, there's others. Okay. We can, we'll, we'll be crystal clear on that. Hey, Jeff. Yeah. Uh, I recall, if I recall correctly, I should say, um, when we were first drafting that rule, we kind of included the language there at the end uh, regarding um, the forces outside the utility's control as an attempt, I think, to try to exclude those. And I fully appreciate that that language uh, could well be tightened. Um, I'm kind of curious, are there any instances where a customer could, without requesting a disconnection, be disconnected for more than say a, a short temporary period, for example, to fix a, a leak or fix a downed wire or some, some other safety issue. Um, I don't want to use the term permanent, but effectively disconnected um, for a long period of time that, that wouldn't just include non-payment. I'm seeing at least some answers, um, yes for tampering from one person. And then some Hi, this is Chicky with Raytown Water. And we may do a disconnect for non-compliance um, for like backflow. If we don't receive backflow uh, res test results, um, we're required to disconnect for T DNR rules and regulations. And that might, that might be a day or two, or it could be a month. It just kind of depends on how the customer handles the situation. 
Yes, and I'm seeing some other, several other people mention black flow, maintenance, theft, weather impacts, uh, main replacement projects, planned outages. Um, and I'm seeing several people questioning whether or not you would you would combine those into involuntary. So it definitely seems like the general read is that involuntary, as, as most of the utilities are understanding it, is referring explicitly to non-payment um, and that there are potentially another category out there for when a customer doesn't request a disconnect, but they are disconnected, but for some reason other than not paying their bill. Am, am I understanding that correctly? John, you might also in the water industry have some situations where uh, pursuant to those disconnect agreements, a person hasn't paid their sewer bill to their municipality and water gets disconnected and they may or may not be caught up on on the water side so Dean, that, that, that's a great point that, that the sewer connection is is one that i hadn't thought of um i was going to say maybe instead of calling it an involuntary disconnect we call it a non-payment disconnect um, because that really gets to the heart of what we're trying to accomplish there uh but the, the, the sewer does give me pause because you could have a municipal sewer, right? Um, Correct. Yeah. Okay. A anybody else? Any other sort of outstanding what ifs? Weather is an obvious one that was that was raised that um, seems like that would be an involuntary disconnect. Are you saying that a weather disconnection would be one that falls under this definition, Jeff? Because I'm not sure that utilities seem to agree with that. I thought weather was raised by somebody. Yes, as an example of when you would have an involuntary disconnection where, but that wasn't caused by non-payment. Yes, that, that, that's what I'm saying. Right. I'm agreeing with the utilities. Is it worthwhile for us to track that separately? Is that, as, as you understand the Naruk resolution, are they focused primarily on, on tracking involuntary for purposes of non-payment? To, to be clear, what, what I'm saying is that the feedback I'm getting right now is that the, the, the term of art involuntary disconnect is overly broad. And moving forward, we might want to consider, say, non-payment disconnect or, or something akin to that, uh, which would alleviate the, the weather theft diversion safety tampering black backflow it, it does raise the sewer issue um i guess we'll need to to think about that and, and maybe do some research typically um and that gets us a question for for cheeky or for uh stacy or, or or dean brian uh legrand if, if you're on um if uh if, if the municipal i mean is it is it common to have one customer up to speed on their payments for for their sewer system but not water and or vice versa yes um the municipalities they um their bill is higher and typically by the time it gets to us for a disconnect um they're like months and months behind and it's hundreds and hundreds of dollars um, by the time they're actually getting shut off for sewer. And, and so, so, so to be clear. Is, their water so, bill is cheaper than their sewer bill anyway. So they right. usually typically pay that because we're on it on the collection side. Sewer, the city, they, you know, they're not as um, prompt as far as collecting on their sewer. So the delinquency is much higher before they actually shut off issue a shut off on water for that so so to be clear um if, if a Go utility ahead. okay um if sewer if, if the municipal sewer wants to shut off power it's the billing practice of, of the water utility to honor that even if that util if that customer is current on their water bill that's correct because that's our state statute there it is okay thank you 
Yeah, I, I think I think I'm the only one on the call that probably has both scenarios where we have sewer customers and we rely on the water company to um, shut off for us so that we don't cause a public health risk. But there are places where we we cannot get an agreement with oh, the really? um, with the water company, and our only recourse is to unfortunately install a sewer valve. We've we've pulled that trigger once in the state of Missouri. So, um, and I think the digger coming on site was enough for the person to pay their bill. Um, but um, if you, as we've been talking through this, it kind of seems like um, we might be talking, when we talk about involuntary dis, uh, disconnections, if they're due to weather or maintenance, aren't those reported as outages versus a disconnect? So if we have, you know, a main break, it's not viewed as a disconnect to that customer's house. It's a water outage and it may only be one customer, it may be multiple versus um, they've tampered with their meter or they continue to block the meter and we can't read it, things like that. So Stacy, do, do you guys right now, and this is, you know, it, it, it's beyond my, my skill set, uh, do the water utilities report or record outages? We do. Is that something you file with the commission? We the do. We, we okay. notify. We notify every time there's there is um, an outage. But by okay. definition, if if there's a drop in pressure under 20 psi or a complete outage, we have to issue a boil advisory. So the the quickest and easiest way to get that count would be to look at the number of boil advisories issued in any given period of time. Okay, so I've, that makes sense on the boil advisory. That that makes perfect sense. But what about on the gas side? Um, any the gas uh, utilities are outages something that are is that a metric that is tracked and reported to the commission? Jeff, this, this is Brian Patterson from Spire. I, I'm I'm not sure for Spire, but I know that we're we don't count that as a uh, disconnection. Okay. We don't count outages as a disconnection. Got it. I know uh, for for the on the electric side, we we do have safety safety scores um, and we're just reliability metrics that that are filed both in EFIS and in with the uh, EIA, but um, I. I, I can follow up with that on, on an individual basis with, with the utilities. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to move on to I, which is a reconnection. Uh, reconnection is a, a, a something that was highlighted in the NARUC resolution. Um, I'm curious on feedback whether or not that's a, a metric to, to, to track here. Right now, we, we have it as a trackable item. But re re reconnection shall mean the provision of a utility service to a unique residential account that has previously ceased receiving the utility service, whether it recurs remotely or at the physical location. And this is for those utilities that have AMI in place or you know, presumably will have AMI in the future. Uh, so Spire's question here is, would this definition include voluntary turnoffs or would it also encompass involuntary turnoffs as determined by I above? Um, would this definition include transfers of service or new service startups? These are all valid questions. Um, you, and I guess really the, the question comes down to how finite do we want to, to look at uh, the reconnection of, of customers? I would say, speaking for myself, uh, ideally we would want to know on the involuntary or the, the non-payment side. Um, so I'll, I'll pose this question to you, Brian, since, again, this is your draft. Uh, is that something Spire is able to do uh, to track for customers that have are being reconnected because now they're, they've paid their, their past due balance and they're, they're back up to speed? Yeah, we're able to do that. I think part of this was just um, clarification. When you think reconnection, I think a lot of people just 
I really think about disconnected for non-payment and then paying their balance and turn back on. But as you know, there's seasonal customers too that will turn off, let's say in April or May, and then turn back on in October when, when the weather starts getting cold again. And really just one of that clarification is, is it just voluntary or voluntary? That, that's a, thank you for bringing that up uh, because I had to spend a considerable amount of time this summer explaining to people above my pay grade why the, ga the natural gas customers' accounts look different. Um, and, and it is it's just because that, that seasonal uh, usage. Um, do you have a preference at this point? I'm asking because really, I mean, this is going to impact your numbers more than anything, but it sounds like Spire looks at those seasonal customers as voluntary? Correct. The seasonal customers we do look at as voluntary. Um, and it really depends on the whole point of this and really trying to compare apples to apples. If it's really about customers that are unable to, to pay their bills, I think we would want to just focus on, you know, customers that are disconnected for non-payment, to, talking about H. And then for I talking about the customers that were able to pay and reconnect service. But once again, that's just just my opinion. I, uh, I I'd agree with that. Can, can I ask a question since I've got you here? Um, if the hypothetical here is if I'm a Spire customer and I've got an overdue balance, um, say in in March, um, and I contact the company to discontinue service, uh, but I still have an outstanding balance. At that point, am I am I counted as a um, involuntary or a voluntary customer? So I would say since the cu customer requested the turnoff, it would be voluntary. And I know that we could you could argue that both ways. Right, and that, that's that's the rub because I, I've got a fair amount of customers who pay that balance come the fall. Is that a safe assumption? Oh, yes, definitely. Okay, well, so this is, this is a good question we'll, we'll probably have with all the gas utilities. Um, I don't necessarily have a strong preference one way or the other. I think the, the key goal for me on my end is to make sure that all the gas utilities then are, are calling it or counting it the same way. Um, but that's where I'm flagging uh, reconnection as, as something to circle back up on. Jeff? Hey, Jeff. Oh. Uh, sorry, go ahead, Brian. You first. Please. Hey, Jeff, I just had one more clarification on that one. As far as yeah. if a customer was disconnected for non payment at, at, a, at a premise and then moved to a disconnect for non payment at one premise and then throughout the summer moved to a, another premise. I just want to make sure that this isn't premise specific. It's really just the actual act of reconnection due to non-payment. This is Dragu. We would actually prefer it to be the other way. <laughs> premise to premise. Yeah, this is Christopher Inspire. I, I was going to bring that up too, Brian, because I think that some billing systems would have a different type of order to reconnect in that situation. So it might be really difficult to track a reconnection where you you get disconnected for non-payment at one place and then move into another place the very next week. Um, it may not be the same type of, of order type or field activity type. And I think that's primarily how we track a lot of them. So it could be difficult to do it when it's not the same premises. So this is a pretty good conversation, Jeff, but I want to cut in just because you've had a couple questions here posed by people in chat. Uh, well, actually, the first one's more of a comment. Somebody had said that they would prefer to see the uh, split between voluntary and involuntary for the reconnections and, and to track the duration of the disconnections prior to the reconnection. I believe part of our rule might have gotten to tracking that that duration, but I'm not sure if that made the final cut. And then at the same time, somebody also asked that um, 
are there separate tracking for voluntary uh, disconnection, sorry, voluntary reconnections with the rears? All right, I'm, does that mean that there are separate tracking for voluntary with arrears? I don't know how to respond to that. I would assume like all, so there's, okay, now I, now I remember this. Okay, so this is, I, I feel like Sarah's referring back. Okay, I'm sorry. There you go. And it was my my question, and it I I posted it when you were talking, I think, to Brian, um, and I was just trying to ask um, because you have seasonal customers. Does that mean you already track voluntary disconnects with arrears, as opposed to voluntary disconnects with full that are already like fully paid uh like would that be a difficult metric to provide or is that something you already track was that question to to spire yes yeah so we do not track the voluntaries if they have a balance or not and really that would be tough by the way because if you think about it whenever a customer will request their service to be disc or to be turned off they're going to have a balance because they're going to receive a final bill. So you're going to have to look at it later on to find out if that was paid or not. At what point does that customer become an involuntary customer? So in, in my opinion, if they actually go through the, the disconnect process, which they re receive multiple letters, and then we turn off for non-payment if they went through that disconnect process. And the disconnect process, so the, the customer has been disconnected because they called it in. They've got an outstanding balance. They don't, they don't pay that balance. It's, it's March at this point, May, June, July, August, September, October. At what point does Spire then go after that customer? Well, um, I'd have to check, but there's actually a, a certain number of days before it's referred to a um, collection agency. I don't have that number of the days off the top of my head, Jeff. Okay. But it, Brian, would it be fair to say as soon as it goes to that collection agency and they go after them, then they would be an involuntary disconnect or a, a disconnect for non-payment? I think that's something that you could, you could say, but I will say it, that would be just in my opinion, harder to track. And the reason why I say that you're gonna be doing look backs all the time. So if you're trying to provide just data for April, you might not be able to provide April data until June, until you're sending out stuff to third parties. In my opinion, it, was, it would just be really hard to track. Okay. okay. Yeah, and I'll speak up for, for Evergy that those would not be things we would be tracking. Right, so we're looking at the involuntary kind of like we talked about being a um, for non pay reason and that that's kind of the the reconnect we would be tracking. So if a customer paid their balance got turned back on at that very same address. So, you know, I think that was Brian that was talking If a customer asks to move and then comes back on in our system months later that would look like a new turn on to us so okay yeah I think my big my big question that lingers is if someone um asks for disconnection are there is there a chance that they're going to be double counted for both voluntary and involuntary disconnect on the gas side Uh, just speaking for Summit, um, I think, you know, we generally do it by the type of work order. So I don't think it we would 
double count that because if if they voluntarily turned off, even if they end up with a pass due balance, the volu- the the turn off was a voluntary work order, a voluntary disconnect work order. So I don't think they would end up getting double counted like that, at least, at least for us. Is that true on the electric side as well? If if you have an electric customer, I I'm moving or I'm, I'm going away. I want to shut down my service. I've still got an outstanding bill, but I never pay that bill because I'm I'm not around anymore. Uh, would would it be a work order essentially that that was a voluntary disconnect? In our case, yes. This is Jerry Goo from Avergy. Yep, it would. Okay. We would we would look at those as a voluntary situation. Yep, that makes a lot of sense. So, as I understand it, really, when we're talking about involuntary or disconnect for non-payment, it really is the physical act of the utility taking the the action to shut off service. If a, if a customer takes the action in some manner, and even if they don't end up paying their bill, uh, they're still considered voluntary. I'm going to pause there, and if, if anybody's got a, a, a different line on that, please speak up. Okay. That that point alone might explain some of the the, the irregular irregularities that we're seeing in, in the data, um, but that that thank you, uh, Jay. So third party really? collection agency. Sorry, oh. Jeff, I had, I had one quick question. If a customer yeah. is going to transfer service between one address and another within the same service territory, um, and so they're going to stop taking service at, at address A and start taking address service at address B at, at pretty much the exact same time. Do the utilities record that as a disconnect or is the transfer of service just not recorded at all? Is it a, a disconnect and reconnect or how is that generally handled? This is the, the premise to premise versus account to premise question that was raised. I'm pretty sure this is this is Brian from Spire again. I'm pretty sure that is just counted as a voluntary turn off and then just a, a turn on at a new premise. I will double check on that, but I'm pretty sure about that though. Yeah, this is Julie with Evergy. We would uh, we can double check, but that, I believe that's how we're tracking it too. Great, thank you. Would it be recorded as a disconnect then or as a turnoff? Are those separate things that are tracked? It, it would not be considered a disconnect at Spire. Because when really when you're talking about disconnect, once again, it's going back to the non-payment, and that's really not what we're considering a disconnect. It could be, I guess the voluntary disconnect is what it could be, but it's a turnoff. And I think, you know, maybe maybe that's the key at the end of the day with, with a lot of this rulemaking is if we can narrow it down to really that non-payment disconnect and make that as crystal clear as possible, I think that's going to be your apples to apples comparison because there is a lot of, of uh, variables outside of that. And I, I think the current current reporting metrics reflect that. Okay, uh, Jay, for third party collection agents, I mean, any person, agent, business, or legal entity engaged by a utility, but which is not subject to the direct control of the utility, for the purpose of collecting monies owed to the utility following the non payment by a customer for utility service previously rendered to that customer. Again, uh, Spire, in this instance, with third party collect agency, you can see vendor technician who goes to the premise to collect the door at the door prior to the disconnection, or the third party vendor who attempts to collect unpaid debt that the final bill is issued with remains unpaid. Brian, thoughts? 
Um, I, I personally think this would be um, when it goes to the third party after the final bill is paid. Once again, that's just my personal opinion. But we were just trying to get clarification to find out what we were really trying to define here. Got it. Uh, and I, I think you are the, you probably can't hear it, but, and I apologize for this because I'm going to keep going back to you, but uh, if you can mute after you, you've talked, that would be appreciative. I'm trying to do it each time. Sorry about that. No problem. There it is. Um, so in regards to third party collection agencies, uh, we did get a number of feedback from utilities on this. And I know, for example, Amber, Missouri has a number of different uh, vendors that they use. Our intention behind that uh, is what what, what Brian had, had suggested that we're really talking about that third party collector um, that is collecting the dollars as opposed to that third party that that shuts off the service. Uh, I don't know if anybody has different thoughts on that, but we, we can clarify that in in the language here. OK. I might add that if anybody has suggestions on how to clarify that language, uh, and you don't need to raise it here, obviously, but um, that feedback would also be very helpful. Yeah, um, you know, ideally, when we when we convene again in the first quarter of next year, uh, we'll open this up as a Word document uh, with track changes, and we can edit accordingly. Um, K, uh, unique residential account shall mean any instance where the wherein the utility is agreed to provide service to a particular customer at a physical particular physical location with a single identifiable meter. Um, all right, Brian, pulling you off of, of mute here again. Uh, does unique residential account differ from the definition of customer in E above? Yeah, I think this kind of goes back to what you were mentioning earlier in, in your presentation and really talking about maybe an account that can have, we call them service agreements. So let's say I personally might have an account, uh, an account, but I have a couple of different properties. So I have a couple of different service agreements. Really just trying to define account here. Are we really just talking about service that's provided to a premise? That's really what we're trying to clarify. So I'll, I'll say from, from my perspective, how I approach it is, um, when I showed well, on the PowerPoint, when I showed the percentage of disconnects relative to it, it was relative to accounts, re residential accounts, uh, total accounts. Um, those are just the, the account numbers that, that the utilities had reported in, in their annual reports. So I guess the question for the utilities here is, how are you defining accounts? Can, can Jeff Mark have... 10 accounts and is that counted as 10 accounts or is it one account with 10 premises uh, or is it both? So I'll, I'll pause there and, and people can, can help me understand that, how, how you want to approach it. If Jeff, just speaking, this is Brian again, speaking for Spire, it could be both at Spire, depending on what the customer is really requesting. So if a customer wants to, in your, your scenario that you threw out, if you wanted 10 separate bills mailed to you and to maybe to different addresses, you would have 10 different accounts. But let's say you wanted to have one bill, it would still have all your information for all your different premises on there sent at one time to, to one premise, then we could do that as well. So we can personally do both, but that's why we really wanted clarification. I personally think it's at the premise level because I think the accounts can get confusing. Okay. Uh, other utility spots? This is Jim from Summit. We, we just do an account per premise and we can assign multiple premises to a person. And a person is sort of a different set up in, in the in the system, uh, but, but the accounts are, are just basically by the meter. Okay. So the, the, the key variable there is a meter. Do you, we're, we're really just, when we say account, we're really saying meter. Is that fair, Jim? 
I think that's fair. Yeah, it, it, it's by the location. So okay. yeah. Are there any utilities that don't operate that way? That don't view each meter as a separate account effectively? So this is tied with everybody. And um, we, we generally have an account and you can have multiple meters under an account um, or service agreements, if you will. Um, and so you can run scenarios where uh, you'd have multiple you could exceed in theory the number of meters that you do have accounts for because they roll up under an, under an account. Yeah, this is Diana with Liberty. We can have an account that has multiple meters, for example, some old apartment buildings where you could have, say, 10 meters on one account. Do you mean just like a master meter, Diana? Yes. It, well, they can be separately metered, some of those grandfathered in ones. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, this is problematic. Yeah, I think, it, Jeff, this is Julie, and this is some of the conversation we've had around how we're doing some of our COVID reporting, right? So, so things right. are held at different places, right? So a customer may held, hold their balance at an account I think it was Brian who was explaining that, but they, but we track their service and their usage at 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 a, a service agreement level, which is where we would show, um, you know, a cut for non-pay or you know that kind of stuff. So um, this does get tricky when uh, utilities have different billing systems that that do this differently. Okay. This um, is Jermaine from. Pardon me. This is Jermaine Graves from Amherst, Missouri. May I speak? Please. On this, okay. As we described in our survey response, you know, for us, it's um, an account is created for a customer at a premises. So I guess we're getting <laughs> um, to know that there's a little bit of a difference across the utilities, but that's how our system is structured. I'm sorry, can you hear me? I had my mic flipped up. Okay, um, so we're similar kind of, it sounds like to Amarin where um, we have a premise, which is, you know, the, the residence or it could be a commercial property, but, and then that customer will have an account, um, a, a contract account number. Typically for a residential, it's gonna be one account number, one premise. Um, when we get into commercial, it's a little bit different and where they may have, um, a few meters under a an account number, um, but it will all have one premise number. So it's more tricky when it comes to commercial. With residential, it's pretty easy for each address they have. So even if it's a like a landlord or you know they own a bunch of rental properties, for each address that they own and they set up service, they will have a different account number for each of those addresses. So yeah, it's, it sounds like we all kind of do it a little bit different, but um, what Jermaine was just saying, it's we. it sounds like we're kind of similar to them. Um, ours just gets a little more tricky when we're dealing with commercial properties. Thanks, Tracy. So that uh, You're welcome. I, in, I might be in the minority on this phone call, but I, I really do appreciate this feedback because uh, you know, just, just for my position, I do have to try to explain what this data means to people, and uh, this is helping. Uh, so, um. hey Jeff, it's Christopher at Spire. I think just hearing everybody and and you know having some some experience with multiple of these large billing systems, I think when you said, yeah, you know, uh, really for. Uh, gas charges for a meter. I think that's getting us as close as we can for right now to talking about the same thing. So, you know, billing for the gas that's going through one meter um, because, you, you know, you don't want to tie the, the premises to it either because you have multiple premises going to a meter. I mean, that gets, that gets kind of complicated. You have multiple meters at a premise. Um, but if you say the gas flowing through one meter, the billing for the gas flowing through one meter, um, 
for the most part, we cover a lot of how these billing systems work, whether that meter is being billed from a service agreement or from an account. It, it works either way. It's billing for that one registered, the, the, either the gas or the electricity from that one meter. Now, there could be some very, very few exceptions to that, but I think that gets us really close. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Uh, we're, we're taking notes and I, I mean, I've got a big asterisk here and I really do feel like this is something I'm going to have to, to, to discuss with each of, of you in, individually and, and sort of have a, maybe a matrix like broken down here, uh, at our next call and we can just fine tune this, uh, because really there's, there's a couple heavy lifting points here. And I think this is one. Is there anybody who can push back on what Christopher or would push back on what Christopher suggested regarding the possibility of tracking disconnects at a meter level? I guess not. I guess I look I, at it this way. I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry. This was Tracy. I mean, it may be something that Missouri Mayor can do. Um, but we typically don't, we don't bill, it's kind of goofy. We bill the customer, not the meter, or that's kind of the philosophy. So a lot of um, our information when it comes to disconnections is going to be based on the contract account number and not necessarily the meter number. I'm not saying it couldn't be done, but it, I don't think it's done currently. It may have to be something that we would attempt to create, but I don't know how that would work out. Just putting that out there. Thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I think we'd have to think through that too from an energy perspective, because to your point, the, you know, meters is yes, where the physical disconnections happening, but those billings and where we're tracking kind of the collections and things like that is at that account level. So we just need to think through it. Thank you. John, I mean, two, two thoughts I had on this. One is, you know, I mean, maybe there is a clause there that kind of gives us a margin of error in, in what we're reporting uh, to, to account for that. And maybe that's sort of a lazy way of, of getting to this. Um, the alternative here is, is what I'd ask the companies to consider is you report the number of accounts that you have. And what I'm hearing right now is like, let's say, hypothetically, there was a thousand accounts. You could have, depending on how you're doing it, at the end of the day, if everybody got disconnected, more than a thousand disconnects or less than a thousand disconnects, depending on how you're tracking that. Does that make sense? That's what I'm hearing. Yeah, that sounds correct. Okay. Uh, Jeff, I'll, on. Sorry, yeah. just quick. We had a, a question come in. It was actually related to um, the definition, the prior definition. Somebody wants to know whether all utilities uh, allow customers to pay the technician at the site when they arrive to disconnect service. Is, is that something that's regular uh, utility practice to allow uh, payment if the technician arrives to disconnect service? This is Chicky with Raytown Water. Uh, we used to do that years ago, but probably in the last 10 years, we do not collect money in the field. Uh, mainly it's a safety air, uh, issue for our, our people. Um, so we have not done that. We are no longer doing that. Um, there's other ways for them to make payment online, call us, come in person, drop it off. So rather than putting that on our uh, employees out there in the field um, and having to worry about their safety because kind of living crazy times right now, um, we've stopped that practice. And I would add to that, you guys, I don't know how many other um, organizations on the line use third-party contractors in the field um, because we use 100% third-party contractors for our operations, we do not take any payment in the field at all. Is, is there anybody that does take payment? Evergy, uh, Evergy does still. 
Spire does take payments as well, but it's there's no cash payments. It would only be online. That's okay. the same with Summit. We'll we'll take uh, we'll take payments, but we won't take cash. This is Jermaine Grubbs from Amber, and my understanding is no, we don't take payment in the field. So does this impact who you view as a third party? Um, I don't remember what definition it was under, but. You might have to scroll up a bit. Yes, so third party collection agencies. Um, I guess that I guess that just helps inform the questions under J. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Sarah. Um, I, I, in, if, if you already said something, I, I apologize. Um, in my notes, I don't have whether or not uh, Liberty takes um, collections or not. Patsy or Angie, can you answer that one for us? Jeff, this is Diana. I might need to find that out for you. Okay, uh, that, that is fine. This is Angie. We do we do take payments in the field, both checks and cash. Okay, excellent. But, Thanks. But Jeff, even if they're if they take the payment in the field, isn't isn't the intent of Jay really the the a collection agency? Meaning that no longer are we trying to collect the money on our own behalf. We're going to pay someone else to collect it, not to go to their door and collect it and turn them off, but to chase that money until forever. It it, it is the intent, Stacy, and I, I think we're going to be crystal clear that we don't mean a third party that's shutting you off or a third party that's collecting your bill to prevent okay. you from shutting off. Yeah. Okay. Good deal. I, I, yeah, I look at the third party as you're at the point of uncollectibles at that point. There you go. Yep. Right. Okay. Uh, looks like we got a long. Sarah, um, I'm just going to, do you just want to articulate that question? Which question? Uh, starting, I guess, I might also suggest that all utilities agree to have the same contractor. Oh, that was to you privately, Jeff. Um, I I was oh, suggesting that <laughs> I was suggesting that there might be a couple of different ways to approach identifying oh, accounts. Um, hey, that's, 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 that's a good point. Um, uh, so there are a couple of different ways that I suggested to you. You can share them if you wish. Okay, I, I appreciate the feedback, and I, I hope it goes without saying. But we'll 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 definitely follow up with staff on this. Um, you know, we appreciate the the feedback that staff gave in, in the rule write up, and we're, we're cognizant that they crossed out the definitions. So uh, we will we we will definitely are, you know come to some sense making with you guys too on this. Um, on, uh, I'm sorry, what letter did we leave off of? Unique residential account, L. Well, I think L is a good one. Utility means electric, gas, water, sewer. And it, it, it sounds like there's a pushback from the steam heating community. Uh, so um, I'm not gonna go to die on the sword over that. Uh, M, uh, voluntary disconnection shall mean the succession of regulated utility services, whether completed remotely or by going to the premise to physically disconnect that is undertaken at the request of the customer receiving service. Uh, does this definition include premises where we do not remotely or physically disconnect the service? All right, what do you think, Brian? So this is kind of brought up, I'll, I'll use a, maybe an example here. Let's say um, you, I bought your house and you're selling your home, I bought your house, you call Spire and request a turn off, and then I'm calling a request of turn on for the same day. We would, you know, really put in the order to to stop billing you, 
And we would count that as a, a voluntary disconnection, but technically we never turn the gas off because we put it into my name. So we would count it as a voluntary disconnection, but it just wasn't physically turned off. So really, I think it's clarifying, are we trying to count, you know, like termination of gas service charges or physically disconnecting the, the meter? I agree with that logic. Uh, does, does anybody else uh, feel differently? We, we can clarify that language. Um, I, this is Tracy. I would agree. That's kind of, that's how we look at it. We do the same thing with the water. Um, there are times also that we go out to physically disconnect. However, uh, maybe the curb stop is broken and we're unable to turn the water service off. However, we stop billing the customer. So the water's technically on, um, but the customer, their service or their, their billing um, has ceased. So we would consider that as well as a voluntary disconnection. Okay. Yeah, that makes perfect sense to me. So to start uh, on a question that was kind of, that I raised earlier, I guess. Um, if you have voluntary disconnections when the customer requests it and involuntary for non-payment, is there a third option of, of disconnections that occur that are not requested? And I, I know that outages was mentioned earlier. Is that, is that a universally understood term amongst the utilities? Um, or or how, do, how do utilities track that, that third category of disconnections that occur without the request but are not by non-payment? So John, this is Stacy. Um, we are third bucket, if if you want to call it that, would be a non-compliance or an administrative disconnection. So if we um, say a customer parks their boat over the meter, so we're unable to get a meter read, um, we've got a standard operating procedure that we follow where we notify, we notify a second month, and if it happens the third month, they could be disconnected. Um, another would be um, if they tamper, if there's evidence of tampering. So unfortunately, you've got people who go out and try and mess with the meter and they can be dis subject to disconnect for that as well. Um, I think Cheeky with Raytown brought one up earlier as well. Um, if you, we require backflow prevention check once a year because you've got irrigation or a pool, something like that and they fail to comply, um, they can be disconnected for that as well. So we call those um, non-compliance. How well does your system, how capable is your system of, of tracking those? Systems? Really, really good. The, the customer information system that we started on at the start of the year is pretty robust, and we have the ability to um, tag that information. So we we had the, I have the um, luxury of starting with a new system. So we talked through a lot of this before we implemented, and we knew these were things we wanted to be able to track versus having to go backwards. So not a lot of historical data, but we're doing a great job of tracking it now. So polling the other utilities, uh, what other utilities, can, can they separately track those? And I'll use the term that, um, that Stacey did non-compliance or administrative disconnects separately from involuntary and voluntary? This is Tracy with Missouri American. Um, I'm not sure if we currently track those. We we also call them non-compliance. Um, it could be something that we probably could track through um, service, each service order type has, we call it a MAT code, and there's uh, a particular service order MAT code that um, if we've actually gone through the process, of course, we, you know, we send out letters prior to disconnecting the customer um, for noncompliance, but if it actually goes through, I mean, it's a possibility um, that that could be tracked. I'm not sure if we if that's something we currently do or not. It may be.
this is Chicky with Raytown Water. Um, we track sewer shutoffs and reconnect separately from our water, um, basically for billing purposes to the city. Um, but and usually we don't have a whole lot of other non-compliance as far as like DNR issues. Um, we do track things for theft of water and illegal usage, uh, disconnects. We could, um, we do all ours through so-called job codes on our work orders. So we don't do a lot of tracking right now, but moving forward, we could be more specific on that tracking. This is Jermaine Grubbs with Amron. I think, yes, we, we track voluntary versus involuntary. I guess where I'm um, struggling a little bit is, you know, like we described in our survey responses, we have a termination of service where it's at the customer's request, and then we have the discontinuance of service. And we have 10 different reasons for disconnection of service set out in our tariff. And, and number one of those 10 reasons is non-payment, um, but you know nine others um, to be included. And then I think you had asked a question about outages and, and for us, that's a completely separate bucket, I believe. And we, you know, for reliability metrics, et cetera, we report that separately. So I, don't, I hope that responds to your questions. Okay, on, on that note, uh, thanks, Jermaine, it, it, it does. Um, we've got about, I've got nine minutes until the top of the hour. Um, I think this is as good a place to any to, to pause. Uh, I know that there were a number of non-utility parties and non-regulators on the phone call. Uh, if, if there's any group um, that would like to speak up about um, this, this docket or, you know, provide any other, you know, concerns or suggestions, uh, I'd, I'd welcome that. Uh, so I'm, you know, thinking of the Renew Missouri, National Housing Trust, Sierra Club, um, Empower Missouri. Uh, I think those are the ones that I remember hearing. If, if the Division of Energy, uh, any feedback, I'll pause. Of, of course, this is an open docket, so you can always file, you know, comments uh, after the fact. Uh, we'll make a point of making the, the PowerPoint available in EFIS um, and the, the most recent uh, Excel PowerPoint uh, with updated data. Um, and hopefully it's it's accurate. Um, you know, well, if not, I'm sure you'll let me know if we got a number wrong here or there. Uh, thank you uh, to everybody. Uh, this was very productive on our end. Uh, and we really do appreciate the uh, the interaction here, uh, and uh, I think we made progress. Um, much more optimistic and um, than I was uh, this morning. So, um, John, any, any other final comments on your end? Yes. Uh, somebody just uh, uh, asked whether or not this recording was put on the commission's website. So, uh, I have done my best to record this session. I think it has worked. Uh, assuming that I have successfully recorded it, I will be endeavoring to put it on the Commission's website. I do not know the exact steps to go through to do that, uh, but um, I, we will attempt to put it on the Commission's website. Um, I can't make any promises, though, because I'm kind of new to this and I've, we've never done this before. <laughs> there you go. Uh, we'll make a good faith effort. Uh, we've got every intention of making this public. Uh, I personally, you know, I'm, I'm hoping I can look at the recording to, to make sure I, ca I caught everything. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. We, we will be reaching out to individual parties here over the next few months, um, you know, as, as time allows. All right. Uh, thanks, everybody. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be in touch and, you know, be sure to, to check up again with EFIS. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Hey.